Hello to the Chicos and the Chicas. Today marks the day of a big project that I'm super excited. Um, we are going to launch a new series here on YouTube where I am going to sort of reflect on the thought process of players as they play a game. Now, in order to make this happen, I actually reached out to a few players and requested them, asked them to record themselves as they play, send me the footage so that we can follow along and observe how they think, what they think, and then I'm going to add my extra bits and observations to it so that it almost is going to feel like for you, dear viewer, as if we are real time playing a game sort of parallel and you get to see how the club level player thinks and then how the coach responds to that. So I hope that this is going to be a little bit of a groundbreaking kind of concept and something that is going to be very educational because that is my, the primary direction of my channel. So without further ado, let's kick off. Uh, your guest uh, today is going to be legendary space Amy uh, a lovely lady from the United States um, who plays chess um, and the, she sent me this game where she's going to play the black pieces so I'm going to bring up uh, the footage of that that is Amy already there for you and we are going to now listen to what she has to say whilst playing this game against Mikhail both players are rated 900 rapid on chess.com let's see what we have to work with here Right. Hello to the Chicos and the Chica. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Thank you, Amy. This is already a great video. Great intro. This is the Space Amy <coughs> playing a 1510 rapid game. I'm playing the French. I'm, I'm going to skip certain parts of the video just to accelerate a little bit and to highlight the important points obviously this footage goes for 16 minutes and if we add all my bits and bobs to it it could go uh grow out to be quite a large uh, video so i'm going to here and there just keep a few uh bits and bobs to get to the really meaningful points no disrespect to amy and her fabulous performance and by the way once again thank you you have done a great job in constantly talking throughout the game which was very important for me um, to be able to reflect on the thought process. Nasty. Tr uh, just I'm a little more comfortable in the advance, but that's okay. Yeah. So she's talking about the French, uh, and she mentions that she doesn't really enjoy the uh, exchange French. Got into a nasty trap in the exchange French. I don't know if it's well known in a daily game where my queen got trapped. So we're gonna try not to make that happen. But he's blocking his d pawn. Outstanding observation. <clears throat> so bishop d3 was played by the opponent and Amy immediately takes note of the fact that this is a little bit odd and it blocks in the pawn. Now what I really would like to hear in this particular moment which never takes place, by the way, the way how I really think it should in this game, is an immediate assessment attached to it. And try to avoid being vague here, calling it odd, unusual, unexpected. None of this has any meaning to you. Like, that's not a useful word to work with. Try to be very black and white and call it either bad or good or somewhere in between. But in this case... You need to call it a bad move. Do it. Do, do not be afraid. Don't care what level of player you are. Doesn't matter. You still have a spectrum of really bad to okay to very good moves. And as soon as something happens out of the ordinary, you must place that in here somewhere on that spectrum. And the odd or the, I don't know, uh, or rather something vague like, oh, this was unexpected, is not going to cut it. So if you think it's not good, call it not good. And the reason why you need to do this is because it's going to influence your uh, and uh, affect your response to it. Which is a little odd. So there, the little odd is not going to really help you. I'm just going to reinforce my central pawn. Interesting comment there. Um, 
because the pawn doesn't really need to be reinforced, it's just simply a developing move, but uh, I suppose it's a cool additional point to highlight that. Now this is going to be very interesting, so opponent plays knight e5, which is another bad move for the record, but let's see how Amy processes uh, what's going on. It's actually quite curious how we are going to go from uh, zero to hero there, watch. I guess opponent is trying to bring his queen to h5 and go for checkmate. Not going to allow that to happen. Okay, so here we are completely blundering uh, a queen for uh, the opponent. And this, I think we need to now for the first time actually have a look at the game um, on a chessboard. So I'm going to show you what's going on here. So the opening went e4, e6, knight f3. D5, take, take, bishop D3, knight F6, all great by black. Knight E5. And the first thought that we have here is that the opponent is trying to be playing queen H5, which is just a blunder because we take the free queen. Now, the thought process, the method, which is not quite spoken out, but you can sort of trace it, is great, which is the, what does this do to me? And right now, when I pause the video, Amy is in the process of trying to figure out what this move does. The correct answer to this is that it does absolutely nothing. It's a way too early centralization of a piece that doesn't have a root. It is not supported. So once it gets kicked, it can't stay. And therefore, it's a very bad move. Well, very bad is harsh. It's definitely bad. Not a blunder, but it's a bad move. Now, we take a fair while to come around on this, but uh, kudos to Amy, she does. Of course. Let's listen. It's just a matter of what is the best way to... Oh, he, his queen can't go to h5. It's protected. Oopsie, I forgot to put on the footage. Sorry. Let's go back again. Just a matter of what is the best way to... Oh, he, his queen can't go to h5. It's protected. That would be fun if I got a queen this early. Um, he's trying to... We'll skip the here a little bit. Fork me. I feel like I'm thinking too much this early on. Well, his knight is unprotected, so I might just bring my bishop and castle. Because he can't really do anything here. Great comment by, there by Amy, and I think I made a stupid mistake there because I actually skipped a very important comment. Here, Amy was contemplating to play instead of uh, bishop d6, knight c6, and she refrained from it uh, because of the double pawns. Now, I'm going to talk more about this uh, when we get to the point, but bishop d6, really let's just see what happens. Here. Let's do that. Is that knight? Here, Amy's talking about how the knight is, is knight loose. Trapped? No, it's not trapped. No. But I feel like he has to just go back. Yep, you are fully correct about that. So here is a very great example that we are thinking forward. We are not playing the game in the present. We are playing the game in the future, meaning that now we are playing the anticipation game. What should come? What should happen? And Amy reckons Knight F3 is their only move, and she's correct about that, by the way. So great thinking here. Now, optimally, you wouldn't stop there. What you want to do is to have the move that you think your opponent is going to play and then prepare your response to that. So the optimal level of thinking here, or in Amy's case, the, the next step in her improvement would be that I anticipate knight f3 and my planned response is going to be castles. That is the type of thinking when we are already playing chess in the future, not in the present. Very good stuff there that she recognized knight f3. And then I'll be nicely developed in castle. Actually, she did say that. So now she's thinking that after knight f3, she would castle. Very good. All right, so queen e2 was played. And this is a very key moment in the game, in my opinion. So let's see what uh, Amy has to say about this. I think the relevant comment comes at 4.10. Let me see. Mm -hmm. It's kind of annoying having his knight there. Mm-hmm. I wonder if I went knight to d7 instead of c6 to avoid having to take with a pawn, doubling my pawns. Okay, so this is probably one of the greatest learning from this game. So let's switch again to our um, analysis board to see 
what's going on here. So we play bishop d6, opponent plays queen e2, and then here Amy starts thinking about challenging the knight again with knight e7 or knight c6. Both of them are terrible game losing blunders. Now the reason why this whole thought process takes place is because we are here skipping the most important building block of uh, considering um, what to do after our opponent's move, which is number one really on the list of uh, things to do, which is what does that move do? And we just completely skip that here. I'm guessing simply assuming that it does defend the knight and that's all. Entirely overlooking the fact that there is a, um, a discover check here um, on the E file. Now let's put that issue aside for a second because that is going to be responded to. And then let's talk about the knight placement about the double pawns. This is one of the greatest myths and I really should make more videos about this because the more videos I make about this problem, the more I see this coming back, that people are frightened of double pawns like it was some crazy uh, thing that decides chess games all over the place. Like totally irrelevant. If we look at this position with castles, castles involved, and now we just put everything aside objectively and let's just talk about the knight moves. Knight c6 is far preferable to knight d7 and no one cares about the double pawns. Double pawns are not bad, full stop. So if anyone tells you double pawns are bad, you are allowed to tell them that they are entirely wrong. Stop saying that. They're not. They can be. There are scenarios where double pawns are awful and there are scenarios where double pawns are amazing. And a generic statement like double pawns are bad just makes no sense whatsoever in chess. The same way how to say that isolated pawns are bad is just utter nonsense. Total garbage. So you need to get this out of your system that double pawns are bad. And the reason why it occurs a lot is because the lower you go on the ladder in chess, the more people like to grab onto generic truisms that can govern their thinking. So things like castle early is good for you. Develop your pieces is good for you. These are actually generic rules that work, but then there are further other rules that we try to obey. And there is a big problem when we can't distinguish between the ones that actually are applicable to our position and the ones that are not. And once again, the lower you go on the late rating ladder, you will find that players try to base their thinking around these rules of thumbs instead of actually calculating. And this almost always backfires because there is no, there is not a single absolute rule in chess that applies to every single position 90, 100% correctly, right? So <coughs> therefore you always have to rely on uh, applying calculation to the situation that you are in. So that's just that. But now we would like to get back to um, the other aspect that uh, Amy is going to discover now about the discover check. So that was a pun intended there. Um, if I just like play whatever and he goes knight c6, I'm in check and then my queen gets taken. So that's no fun. Let so now Amy recognizes that, oh bugger, there is a discover check here, so I need to deal with that. Very good. That's castle. Okay, so now comes the second part of the operation that I need to talk about here. And this is a very big difference here between a higher rated player and a lower rated club level player. So I'm going to go back now to my analysis board um, to show you this. Um, so the issue here that we need to recognize, as soon as you see queen e2, the first thing you do is, what does it do to me? It creates a discover check. As soon as you notice that, the next thing you notice is that this move is bad because it piles up heavy pieces on the e file. One thing. Two, it forces you to play the move that you should play. You should desperately try to avoid forcing your opponent to play the best move they have. Black's best move in this position, next move provided that white doesn't blunder, is castles. 
Queen e2 forces black to play the best move. Never a good thing in chess to force your opponent to, to play the best move. And on top of that, we realize that black white actually now piled up too many pieces on the e file. So after castles, rook e8 is going to cause tremendous damage. So here the gap between a higher and a lower rated player is that a lower rated player will go like, woof, I'm threatened. I better hurry away and get out of this uh, threat immediately. A higher rated player will see beyond that and they will go like, they're going to lose the game on the E file. So the story reverses. We go like, ah, uh -uh, this threat is not working this way. No friends, this threat is this way. And it wins for black. Now to turn this kind of thinking to see this deeper, we need to actually start thinking in lines, but also the tactical awareness of having heavy pieces piled up on an open, open file, rarely a good idea, needs to kick in here. All right, let's follow Amy. So I evaded that threat. Mm -hmm. Um... His D pawn is, I'm still thinking about how his D pawn is still blocked. Love this. So she's still stuck on the main, main feature of the position, which is that the D pawn is blocked in. What I again would love to hear is the additional, therefore I stand much better. It is super important that you evaluate your position on a regular basis, optimally at every single move, because it is a piece of information that hangs in the air if we just go like the bishop on c1 is blocked in. But if we connect the dots and we go like white's queen side can't develop, mine can, therefore I'm better. It's very important that you regularly provide information to yourself about what's going on the board and evaluating the position is vitally important. The lower you go on the rating ladder, the more you find that people don't do this for two reasons. A, because it hasn't become their regular habit. But there is a second reason, which is really, really bad. And it's more mentality than anything else. They don't trust their own evaluation. They are reluctant to say something like, I'm a lot better here. Because they misunderstand this for being arrogant or obnoxious or simply they don't trust their skill set to make that call. And it's really, really wrong because it has nothing to do with you. The ego needs to be removed. And the best way to do that is if you don't say, if you are that way inclined, you don't say that I'm a lot better here. You go, black is a lot better here. And that way it has nothing to do with me being smart or smarter than the opponent or offending the opponent, however crazy that may sound, by saying that they are doing pretty badly. Then it's purely objective. It's white, black, black is better. So do that more often. And if I can capitalize on that somehow and put two <coughs> ones in the center. Slipping my pieces or trying to attack. I will um, rewind this a little bit because she... not really have anywhere to go. Uh -huh. Listen to this. And then I can chase his bishop. And does his bishop really have anywhere to go? If I play c5, and then he does something, and then c4. So we are contemplating his c5, c4, which is a good thing that we are thinking in terms of uh, those plans. It's really bad that we tactically are not seeing that rook e8 is winning instantly the game, but um this is what it is so let's continue um watching and see how she comes to the next move which is going to be quite uh telling this bishop doesn't have anywhere to go um but again i'm kind of torn between just developing my pieces or trying to attack um very important concept here she says she's torn between developing her pieces or trying to attack. The second statement, trying to attack, doesn't make sense without actually 
providing moves to it. In fact, neither really makes sense unless we, we actually name actual moves. And this is, again, I'm a little bit repeating myself. You need to be far more exact and precise in your thinking. What does it mean continue developing? Name the move. What are we talking about? Is it knight c6? Is it knight d7? Is it knight a6? Is it bishop e6? And this is, by the way, another big message that I wanted to pass on with this video. Uh, a very common theme, and again, the lower you go, the more you experience this, is that the weaker the player, the broader the horizon of candidate moves. So what we really need to focus on in order to improve is to narrow down the number of candidate moves we look at. A lot of the times I find that these around 900,000 rated players and even higher all the way to 1500 feel absolutely overwhelmed when playing a game by the sheer number of possibilities. And this is where I'm going to contradict myself a little bit. And I tell you that it's basically the um, chess principles that are going to guide your thinking. Are you done with development? No. So develop. What do we develop first? We tend to prefer knights before bishops. And all of a sudden, I narrowed down, and now we are completely omitting the um, the rookie eight from the um, uh, discussion. So let's forget about rookie eight winning the game on the spot because we're past that point. So develop. Okay, if we develop, it needs to be usually knights before bishops. So now we are down to two moves. Two moves. Instead of, oh, I don't know, I could go here or I could put the bishop somewhere or the knight somewhere. And all of a sudden, we're stuck between 10 moves and it's impossible to make a rational call. I really think that my chair sank. Uh, between uh, 10 moves. So, yeah. Um, rely on your chess principles in this regard and then if you follow that thinking pattern that i just showed you you're down to knight c6 or knight d7 both of them are quite okay i just don't really like knight to c6 i just really don't like it so you know what she has zero reason to not to like it uh it's a great move in fact um Barring rook e8, the best move on the board. And here I would like to show you one more thing that is super important. And this, again, requires a lot of practice, a lot of learning. But I feel like I wouldn't do justice to this game if I didn't show and point out this to you. If you are someone who knows their tactical patterns, uh, Checkmate Manual by Crafty Ruff from Chessable comes to mind. But just in general... Um, you know, knowing your basic attacking patterns, when you consider knight c6, you look into the disappearance of these two knights, which immediately points out to you that the very famous Greek gift is absolutely set. We are good to go. So if white marks around here, check here, check here, and it's game over. So you already are looking into the future and you go like, well, the knight is missing from here. My bishop is trained at h2. Hello? I'm good to go for Greek gift. And once again, double pawns, perfectly relevant. In fact, the c6 pawn, super c6 pawn supports the d5 pawn, allows you to play c5. It gives you an open b file. How is that bad? That's my idea of great. So once again, the dogmatic double pawns are bad for you. Pfft, erase that. Um, okay, back to the game. I think I'm going to go here. Bishop d7, just to... And if he takes, I mean, that's fine. I can just take back with the knight or the queen. This bishop is notoriously bad in the French. Um... Okay, there is a lot to unpack here. So, <clears throat> first and foremost, Amy is about to play uh, a move that really pictures the concept of, or depicts the concept of too many candidate moves without a structure. You're bound to pick a bad one. This move may does nothing at all. Is it developing? No. Actually, it's not. And it's very important that we understand this, that for most intents and purposes, this does not develop the bishop. It moves it. Right? 
a developed bishop would look like this. That's a developed bishop. That has a function. It has a job to do. Now, in the sense that bishop d7 also supports the connection of the heavy pieces, it is a developing move. But as far as this bishop is concerned, it's not doing anything on d7. Second comment, or second thing, we are allowing a knight before knight trade for bishop in an open position. Not good. And then she adds to it, justifying that bad decision, that the French bishop is bad anyway. True, except this is not a French. It started off as an exchange French, but that is long gone. So as soon as your opponent throws in a complete lemon like this, those very static, generic statements don't apply. In fact, after the exchange, it's already quite a good bishop, actually, because it has the full scope of the diagonal compared to the French. But because of why it has played a complete lemon, um, yeah, these rules don't apply. Chess, basic chess principles apply instead, such as that bishops are better than knights in open positions. And you need to keep that in mind. A very common case of this, by the way, is when someone learns the Sicilian dragon, which starts off with pawn g6 and the bishop comes here. And then they, for the first time, meet the, uh, the Mora gambit with d4, and they play g6. And when I ask, what are you doing, man? They go, I'm playing the dragon. Well, what dragon? For it to be the dragon, it needs to be the open Sicilian. Your opponent already missed it on move two. Or equally importantly, I could go like, I don't know, I want to do something ridiculous. Bishop b5. And they go like, oh, g6. What are you doing? I'm playing the dragon. But dude, this is not the Sicilian anymore. Everything you know about the dragon is 100% irrelevant because your opponent played something else. You are in unknown territory. It's chess now. So develop. Knights towards the center. What does this do? Kick it out. Million better moves. Same for Amy's game here. This is no longer a French. That board has sailed. We have a free piece to win. We have a misplaced bishop. We have got a marvelous attack against the king. Forget about bad bishop on c8. It's a great bishop. And I don't really care about this bishop. Yeah, so that was a poor move there. <clears throat> Protects c6 if he doesn't take it. Knight c6. Okay, oh. I will accelerate this a little bit now because I took, I think, to too long. g4, but it is protected. We keep on missing so rook e8, I'm by the way. I'm going to go ahead with my plan here of just continuing development. Great. The real irony is, is that if, black, if white takes on c6, we should still take back with the pawn, keeping this bishop on this diagonal, keeping the uh, Greek gift threat alive, but also rook e8, bishop g4 is uh, really great there. Challenging his knights. All right. So unfortunately, we missed a, a rookie win, which was winning about on three different moves back to back. But that's just the nature of the game. We missed the tactics here and there. Okay. B3. I guess maybe he's trying to theme Keto. Yep. Very good. His other bishop up there. His position looks weird. I feel like he should have a lot more space. As Love again the comment. So she's again going to the vague um, area of evaluations, which I call non-evaluation. So instead of saying, I stand a lot better, or they stand clearly worse, she goes, their position looks weird. Call it what it is. It's bad. It's white. Um, all right. If I play d4, his knight I guess goes back in the center. Um, and then maybe we trade knights. Anything else look good here? I could just continue developing, maybe queen to d7. Okay, this is going to be probably an overkill, but I want to show you this because this is again very typical. So a way to improve for Amy, once again, would be to extend the depth of her thinking. So when she talks about he d4, knight d4, oh, sorry, she took with the bishop, um, she stops there, no evaluation, 
no consequences. That line just hangs in air and we abandon this. Don't ever do that. Calculate the line, evaluate it, say it. Better for white, better for black, equal, and then make a decision based on that. Note that after D4, Knight E4, he, this is the beginning of the line where black has got a vast number of tactics, mostly based on the fact that this is on, but also after takes takes, we have, so rook e8, we have queen h4, double attack here and here, and we also can just go check, 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 and then pick off the e4 bishop. Myriads of lines to calculate, and that's what Amy should learn to do now, or should aim to do in the future, and that is to deepen her calculations. So instead of we are looking to go one move, and then not evaluate and then move on. Look deeper than one move, evaluate, and then based on the evaluation, you make a call whether you play it or not. So that is the, the next step. Actually, that's like next five steps. So that's gonna very rapidly make you go from 900 to 1800, really. Like that type of issue persists in different levels between those two rating groups. <clears throat> my rooks, I could bring my rook right to rook e8, and then mm -hmm. if his queen goes to f3, then I can play d4. Now that is a cool line. Having um, said that again, I would love to hear adding to it that, and then I win a piece, bang. All right, well, I don't want to take too much time. Let's, I don't think he has any threats on me right now. Yeah, rook, rook to e8, let's do that. Good stuff. Go on the queen. Yeah, this is looking good. Mm -hmm. So she sees. checking for any threats, <coughs> which I don't think he has. Yes. I might win a piece, you guys. Okay. I hate to be this guy, but I will do this. Um, be confident. There is no I might win a piece here. Either you are or you are not, and you must know it. It's your game. You own it. It's your creation, so you have to know what's going on to the best of your knowledge. Totally okay to be wrong. There is nothing wrong with you saying, I'm going to win a piece, and they actually don't because you overlooked something. But you must, in your, to the best of your ability, call it what you think it is. So don't let, ever allow it to hang in like I might, might not. And once again, I know that part of it is, is that you are on camera and you are reluctant to come across as, you know, overconfident or whatever. But as far as chess thinking is concerned, leave nothing for the vague. Try to be as objective as possible. Great win of the piece. I might win a piece. You not worried about that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So the she clarifies that h7 is safe. Great. <coughs> um, free piece. Free piece. Mm -hmm. Take it and it's back rank. Um, Bishop d2 is a good move for him. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to play it and there's a chance he doesn't see it. Um, I think she was talking about queen e1 here, but that's not really a threat because if the bishop abandons the back rank, there is no back rank mate, and also rook takes, rook takes, bishop f1, defense back, but queen e7 is a fine move. And now I have to worry about threats from him would be, oh, he can't play queen g3. I was thinking queen g3, bishop h6 from him, but he cannot play queen d3, mm -hmm. g3, because that just hangs a queen. All right, what else can I do? I definitely don't want to move my knight, and I feel like he's close to creating a threat on my knight. Um, that doesn't make sense to me because the opponent could have played here bishop g5, which would have made a threat on the knight, but these are irrelevant uh, motives now because, oopsies, we can just play uh, h6 and that's done, dusted. Like, I'm up a piece, but this is definitely... How about a queen trade? <laughs> Good idea. I'm up in material. And then, okay. I'm definitely, I think, going to try for a queen trade here. Um, even though I am the one attacking, I know I shouldn't 
trade queens when I'm attacking, but he's also attacking me. Um, like, I'm definitely seeing him maybe coming and... It's totally practical. So she's correct. The queen e6 with the queen trade idea is perfectly fine here. And it's a very good way to eliminate any kind of unwanted disasters. So good. Attacking good. my knight with his bishop. For me. Yeah, queen e6, great. I'm trying to get out of the habit of playing those kind of weakening moves like g6 to sort of block off his bishop. Um... I don't want to do that, but I might not have any... Oh, h6 blocks his attack. Yeah, now here Amy is talking a lot about an attack that doesn't exist. And it's very important that we clarify this, and this is going to be the last point I'm going to make in this uh, whole game. h7 is not threatened, it's guarded by the knight. End of story. So there is no threat there whatsoever. The threat of bishop g5 and then taking on f6 and then h7 takes seven eternities and I'm not saying that you shouldn't be aware of it but you need to be clear on the fact that right now we are not threatened with anything so we can do whatever we want instead of g6 protecting the knight on f6 e5 no that doesn't work his queen's protecting what about knight to g4 mm -mm. <clears throat> that and the bishop that would blunder this no but that unprotects me very good thinking on h7 and then he i just get mated or very close to me very uncomfortable mm -hmm. ah so much thinking here no you're doing the right thing that would be a really good move for me but ah like defense and offense at the same time is really tough ah. do i bring my bishop back to protect my knight no <clears throat> The knight doesn't need any defense. So, in fact, anytime you are three piece, uh, up a piece, you shouldn't be ever thinking about defending. Consolidating is good. Defending, not good. Is there anything more forcing than okay, that? Okay, let's get to oh. the catactic finish now. Queen, Queen to d5. d5 is looking mighty tasty. If he wants to trade rooks, go ahead, trade rooks. You're down with your good defense. Okay. Oh, no, I just parted. d 4 is a good defensive. Oh. Oh. Yes. Is that just me? Yes, it is. Yes! I won! Look how happy she is. Oh. Look oh. At that. Is that just me? Yes! I won! Awesome. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed <coughs> my video. I'm looking forward to Andres' comments. And you got that, awesome, Amy. Right, let's round it off, guys. So, we have had the game. I think I took a very long, fairly long time to record this, but that was the first time I will try to cut it shorter for the next time. Um, awesome game. I have given a lot of pointers in summary. Think more in lines. Evaluate your variations. And always consider dynamic considerations over static ones, such as attack versus oh, double pawns or oh, my French bishop. Instead, think about what's hanging, what I can attack, and so on. I hope you guys liked it. I'm going to call it a day now with this, but I do intend to continue this. If you would like to be part of this series, please get, uh, reach out to me on Twitter email. You know where you can find me and uh, send me a footage of you playing and I am going to go through it as well. Please don't forget to like, to sub, to comment. And also now you can super thank me down there. I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye.